Out of all of the giant planets of the outer solar system, one in particular stands out. In some ways, at least superficially, Neptune and Uranus are similar to each other in their general quietness. They can form clouds and spots, but can also at other times be nearly featureless. Saturn too seems quiescent from above, serene, though it certainly has its storms. But Jupiter stands out for the sheer violent and chaotic nature of its upper atmosphere, with gases constantly roiling, upwelling, and moving, and megastorms like the Great Red Spot raging for centuries. But there's more to Jupiter than what we see on its face. It's even stranger than the upper atmosphere that we see. That is, in a way, a mask it wears, concealing something even stranger beneath. Ancient isn't quite a strong enough word. Jupiter is believed to be the oldest planet in the solar system, as well as the largest, and by that the first to form, other than the Sun, the parent. It is the oldest sibling. It's actually thought to be as much as 50 million years older than the Earth, and a little older than Saturn, perhaps the second sibling. Though that planet would play a prominent and vital part in the still young life of Jupiter in the universe that will persist for trillions of years more. When the giant world did form, it migrated inward into the primordial inner solar system, partly at the hands of Saturn as the two gas giant planets sought their current orbital resonance. But this wandering process, known as the Great Tack Hypothesis, may have profoundly affected the formation of the rest of the planets of the solar system, including Earth. Without the presence of Jupiter and by proxy Saturn, the solar system might look dramatically different from what we know today. Jupiter's orbital period is about 11.86 Earth years, almost 12 times our year, and it comes in at just less than a thousandth of the mass of the Sun. With Earth, we could fit 1.3 million of us inside the Sun. Home is very small indeed. Jupiter is also bright, actually the third brightest object in the night sky, after the Moon and Venus and quite a sight even in a small telescope, with its four Galilean moons visible that move each night you look at it, and one or two of its atmospheric bands can be seen, and sometimes even the great red spot is visible with a large enough telescope. The Galilean moons, Ganymede, Callisto, Europa, and Io, themselves are among the most interesting objects in the solar system, three for potential oceans of liquid water beneath their icy surfaces with Ganymede potentially hosting several layered, separate subsurface oceans bounded by exotic ice, and the remaining moon Io for its wild and constant volcanism, due to Io being flexed constantly by Jupiter's immense gravity, generating heat. As important as these moons are in space science today, we had no idea they even existed before 1610. The year Galileo Galilei discovered them with a somewhat primitive optical telescope. This is particularly interesting in light that Ganymede is actually larger than the planet Mercury, which is one of the planets known in ancient times due to its naked eye visibility, alternately in the early mornings and evenings just above the horizon. If Ganymede had been a planet close to the sun, they would have seen it too. Yet at the same time, even larger planets still lay undiscovered in Galileo's time, with Uranus being found in 1781 Neptune in only 1846, and Pluto in 1930. Yes, I count Pluto as a planet. As a small rant, the reason for that is that I don't really like the term minor planet. There is nothing minor about Pluto. It's one of the most interesting objects in the solar system, itself possibly being an ice shell with an ocean of warm liquid water beneath. We don't know the answer to this yet, but setting aside the ice shell moons, and looking only at planets in direct orbit of the Sun, it's possible that if Pluto does have a subsurface ocean, then that might make Pluto second only to Earth in planetary habitability in the solar system, potentially beating out both subterranean Mars and the upper atmosphere of Venus. So I'd support some other set of criteria defining planets that includes Pluto, perhaps a numerical or alphabetical classification system. And does it really matter if the solar system ends up having some unwieldy number of planets after we discover all the Pluto-class Kuiper Belt objects? I don't think so. After all, Jupiter has over 90 moons. Do we call the myriad tiny ones minor moons, 
No, we just call them moons. Do we demote Mars's moons Phobos and Diemos for being too small? No, we don't. They're all moons. Why not extend that to planets, even if we end up with 200 of them in the end? That is the universe, and the solar system is unlikely to be unique in that regard. But I digress. Jupiter is made up primarily of hydrogen, 90%, followed then by helium, and then a bunch of trace gases that are actually more important with Jupiter than they are sometimes given credit for, especially neon. More on that in a bit. Another oddity about Jupiter is that it's not actually round. Rather, it's an oblate spheroid that's contracted at its poles because it's spinning very rapidly, about once every 10 hours. This misshapes it, distorts it. Jupiter is also unbelievably hot. Its interior generates more heat than the planet receives from the sun, preventing it from being an ice giant like Uranus or Neptune. Near its core, Jupiter is thought to maintain temperatures of about 35,000 degrees Celsius, though its very uppermost atmosphere is quite cold, on the order of negative 145 Celsius. That intense internal heat and unbelievable atmospheric pressure is what drives the severe weather on that world. And it has lightning. Here we dip into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. This recent photograph actually shows a green lightning bolt on Jupiter. Emissions from the bolts were known, and the phenomenon had been photographed to some degree. And there was an instance of a rather bright flash on Io in a photometer. That was probably that moon reflecting a lightning flash on Jupiter's far side. But so far, this is the best image of Jupiter's lightning yet, which is surprisingly similar to that of Earth. There are even instances of transient luminous events, or TLEs, in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter that might represent sprites similar to what is seen on Earth, a lightning-related phenomenon not really even known of until relatively recently. We have been to this area of Jupiter's atmosphere. NASA's Galileo mission actually had an atmospheric probe that went with it that dropped into the Jovian atmosphere via parachute in 1995. This was a truly monumental atmospheric entry in that the spacecraft entered Jupiter's upper atmosphere at 106,000 miles per hour. This is in New York to Los Angeles in a minute and a half. Yet the thickness of Jupiter's atmosphere slowed the craft to Mach 1 in only a scant few minutes. If you had been in orbit looking down, the entry fireball from this would have briefly almost outshone the sun in brightness. Hello humanity indeed. This 15,000 degrees Celsius event gave way to a slow descent of the probe into the hell of the Jovian atmosphere. The transmitter functioned for 61 minutes before succumbing probably due to the increasing atmospheric pressure, which at the time of failure was 22.7 atmospheres, about 180 kilometers below its entry ceiling, already under far higher gravity than we know on Earth. The probe recorded intense radiation above Jupiter's cloud deck, relatively few organic compounds not good for any rather already unlikely potential for life in the atmosphere of a gas giant, and very high winds of 640 meters per second at their peak. It actually found less water vapor than was expected for the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, and actually less helium by half than what was previously thought. As we descend below what that probe recorded further into the atmosphere of Jupiter, say we have an immortal, invincible probe, the temperature and pressure would only continue to rise. It doesn't take much to get into very high pressure at Jupiter, just below its uppermost atmosphere, there's actually a layer that's the same temperature as Earth's average surface temperature, but the pressure is already well above that of Earth's atmosphere, crushing but comfortable otherwise. One of the misconceptions about Jupiter is that there isn't anything there other than just gas, with no solid surface until you reach the core. Until recently, we weren't sure it even had a core. There are models of gas giant formation where a core is not formed just a collapse of gas. But this isn't an accurate view. The reality is that Jupiter's gaseous atmosphere as we know it is actually only a few hundred kilometers thick until you get to a very strange state of matter indeed. Neither atmosphere nor ocean. In this regard, while Jupiter is made up of what would normally be gases like hydrogen and helium, the temperature and pressure actually push them into a liquid state. As a result, we might better think about Jupiter as a liquid giant rather than a gas giant, because while its atmosphere is extremely thick, 
it's surprisingly thin before the hydrogen starts getting weird. Under the conditions of this layer of Jupiter, when you go below the true gas outer layer, there really isn't a distinct liquid or gas phase for the hydrogen, rather a supercritical fluid state. This actually exists naturally on Earth in another form. Water just coming out of the black smoker geothermal vents, two boats and Sisters Peak in the Atlantic Ocean at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, is actually in a supercritical state, showing attributes of both a fluid and a gas briefly until it cools. This is actually the hottest water ever seen on Earth. Here temperature and pressure are key. Water would normally boil at sea level at high temperature, but not in this case because of the immense pressure of the deep ocean preventing it. The only way to describe it is denser than steam, but lighter than liquid water. The temperature and pressures involved here for this water are on the order of 300 atmospheres at 407 degrees Celsius. The weird thing here is that this state is actually what's making these particular smokers function. The water seeps deep into cracks in the ocean floor, heats up to a supercritical state, and then being less dense than normal water, it rises and escapes the vent. This is actually part of the process for nutrients oceanic life is using, and metals getting into the seawater. Because supercritical water is especially good at leaching them out of the bedrock. Jupiter's supercritical hydrogen, however, is not quite like water molecules in its properties, but in a similar ambiguous state. Interestingly, however, this weird hydrogen would be transparent. The deeper you go down, however, the more like a familiar liquid this becomes, and Jupiter begins to start resembling a kind of quasi-ocean of liquid hydrogen and supercritical fluids. Again, it all becomes denser and hotter the deeper you go, until hydrogen actually becomes metallic in its properties, meaning it can conduct electricity, but still in a liquid state analogous to mercury or molten metal. In this area, it gets weird, however. Back to neon. In the lower parts of this quasi-ocean, helium and neon precipitate out and fall like rain in the metallic hydrogen. This happens at a radius of 37,000 miles, or 60,000 kilometers, in Jupiter's lower atmosphere. Also in this area, carbon would act weird. And there have been suggestions that these layers would see rainfalls of diamonds, which may also happen deep in Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Do the diamonds accumulate somewhere? Below this, you get to the rather strange core of Jupiter. The Juno spacecraft has indicated that Jupiter does indeed have a core, but it's diffuse and indistinct. There is no dividing line between the metallic hydrogen mantle and the core of Jupiter, just an intermixing and transition region. The core of Jupiter is strange. It's uncertain, partly due to how diffuse it is, what its mass actually is but it's constrained in a combined way to 7 to 25 times that of Earth, and is almost certainly made of metal and silicates. This is weird in another way. There had to be a time early in Jupiter's history when it was accreting this core, and before it accumulated its thick atmosphere, where it was about the size of Earth. I wonder what that looked like. But one could imagine a volcanic molten planet bathed in accreting dust and gas, though not that unlike early Earth but very different from the somewhat terrifying gas giant it would become. The diffuse nature of Jupiter's core might be an artifact of the early solar system. It might have been a product of the accretion process itself, but might also have been due to a large impact, with a 10 Earth mass body a few million years into Jupiter's formation, disrupting an originally solid core. Jupiter also convects. It's a dynamic planet with a strong magnetic field, as a result of movement of deep material, but within this lies a mystery. The composition of Jupiter overall is not all that different from the early Sun, which suggests that the solar system might not have originally been forming up as we might have once thought. It might have been shooting for a multiple star system. Perhaps we are a failed binary star. Jupiter has sometimes been characterized as a failed Sun, something Arthur C. Clarke latched onto with 2001 and the subsequent novels, where you might be able to make Jupiter into a second sun, as though it has never reached its potential. In reality, this is not easily possible. You need a lot more mass and hydrogen to do this than what we actually have. And some have said it's not a failed star, rather it's a gas giant, period. Jupiter is Jupiter. 
but the idea is that the solar system might have been a group of forming protostars early on with Jupiter being the result of one of them. Had things been a little different and more material accreted or moved around differently, who knows what might have resulted. It might have even prevented the formation of Earth and we would never be here. The solar system would just be one of a billion star systems in the Milky Way that had some potential for life in a civilization, but lost the lottery. We simply just don't know. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently eyeing Saturn suspiciously. It's very different from Jupiter, despite also being a gas giant, and in comparison is very unassuming versus Jupiter. It's almost like that while Jupiter rages and rants, Saturn is just whistling and looking away. I think Saturn is hiding something and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live. <laughs>